speaker webcams, and the slide presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Crohn's and Colitis Canada's CEO and President, Mina Mawani. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for joining our webinar as we bring IBD experts here to answer COVID-19 questions that are on your mind. Around the globe, people have united in the fight against COVID-19. On Tuesday, May 19th, the world comes together again to raise awareness for another battle near and dear to our hearts, inflammatory bowel disease. May 19th is World IBD Day, a day that the world goes purple, the designated color of IBD. That day, 40 countries across the globe joined together in a unified effort to raise awareness and recognize those living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis in honor of World IBD Day. To mark the occasion, we have a number of exciting initiatives underway that we hope you will join in on. Watch for our emails and our at Get Gutsy Canada social media. One of those programs is a fundraiser to support critical IBD research and programs. Our gutsy symbol has long stood for courage, resilience, and hope. And now you can don our gutsy person on a high quality Canadian made reusable face mask. These are available through our online store. As a limited promo for World IBD Day, use the discount code GUTSY10 and you will get 10% off. Also, top of mind, we are thinking about our new reality as we venture outdoors with the warmer weather and as restrictions lift throughout Canada. Cities and organizations are starting to open their doors and that brings about new questions which we will continue to address in upcoming webinars and through the content on our website. We are so pleased that we've been able to connect with you every week to support each other through this process. Know that we continue to be here by your side as we learn and adjust to our new normal. As you can see, Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our promise to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of everyone affected by these chronic diseases. We wish you all a wonderful long weekend. We hope it is a time for you to relax, do something special and connect with your family and friends. As always, a big thank you to our task force who also volunteered their time and skills to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for you, our community, during these times. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators, Dr. Gail Kaplan, Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist he is the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as a board of director with Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and Dr. Eric Benjamal. He is the Associate Professor and Gastroenterologist, Department of Pediatrics and School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa, Division of Gastroenterology at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. He is also chair-elect of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Mina. Thanks, Mina. Yeah, so today um, it's our ninth webinar, um, started back on, on March 19th, and what we thought we'd do is something a little bit uh, uh, different. Um, and first, I just wanted to kind of share a little bit of the history of the COVID task force, the webinar, and where we are today, just to kind of explain to you why we're doing something a little bit different um, today. So back on March 11th, the WHO um, proclaimed uh, COVID as a global pandemic, and that day will go down in history um, uh, as such a monumental day, um, and we all know what's happened since since then. And I think it'd be like the day after um, Eric and I, um, with uh, Mina as well as Kate Lee, got together to organize a meeting of this Scientific Medical Advisory Council to try to understand what with this pandemic, um, how would it impact um, patients with IBD and the IBD community? And you have to remember, we, we had this was a brand new virus. We had no idea how this was going to impact anyone. There was no data on it. Um, we were just based on kind of expert opinion and what we what was happening in, in previous um, with previous viruses um, that have affected uh, uh, humans that might be potentially related. Um, we realized that the SMAC needed to be broadened. And so instead of um, just convening the SMAC, we've actually expanded out and created uh, a national task force and included representation across the country, um, adult and pediatric gastroenterologists, nurses, patients' voices, uh, infectious disease specialists, to be able to help us kind of figure things out. And so we came together, we started making our first sets of recommendations, then we asked the question, well, 
how do we communicate this? Um, because most people probably are not going to just wander onto, onto the CCC's website. And that was where the idea of doing these webinars um, was, was born. Um, and our first one happened on March 19th. Um, and we decided as, to do it on a weekly series with a format where it was kind of start um, after the introductions, where I would kind of give an update um, on where COVID was in the world in Canada and update any kind of the epidemiological data that's happening, both from a COVID perspective, but also from a COVID and IBD perspective. And, and I do like being um, an epidemiologist and my foundation of my, my research focusing on IBD and epidemiology. Um, and then Eric would then uh, update the recommendations that were made um, by the task force um, on the Tuesday night preceding the, the webinar. Um, and then what we did was we asked you, the community, questions um, to ask us what are the key questions that you have. Uh, and that's actually helped us in two critical ways. Uh, the first way is that it's helped define these webinars. Uh, and the second way is it actually helped us figure out what to focus on on the task force. Because many times you ask questions, we didn't actually have the answers for them. And that's what then we met as a group and said, you know, are infusion centers safe? Um, you know, what should we be recommending in terms of medication, things like that? The questions that you had were the key questions that we had. And so the, the last part of the webinar series was to create kind of segments that were drawn from your questions uh, and bringing in experts from different expertise and different um, um, areas of, of practice to come on and answer those questions in segments. Um, and, and so that's what we've been doing um, throughout the course of the last eight weeks. And what we decided to do tonight, which was a little bit different, was not actually invite any um, panelists. Um, Eric and I have been moderating these sessions and it's actually been a pretty easy job. We just get to ask questions and put a little bit of input here and there. Um, and today we decided to kind of challenge ourselves and actually answer your questions. Um, and part of it was we've had a list of questions and we haven't not necessarily answered all of them. And also some of them have been asked and answered, but they're such pressing questions that we just wanted to kind of go back and review them together. Um, so I'm gonna give my short, relatively short update here in a second, um, answer a few of the questions as part of my presentation, uh, and then bring Eric and I back and then we'll just field um, either questions that you've uh, posed already and, we've, and we have them prepared to answer, or any questions that you or the audience might have for us. Um, and, and again, just as Sarah had mentioned earlier, we can't answer medical questions, we can't answer personal medical questions, um, but we can answer around those types of questions. So maybe what I'll do is um, pivot to uh, our weekly update. Um, and hopefully everyone can see um, this, Screen is always my very first screen. And again, I just want to start by thanking uh, Joseph Windsor and Stephanie Coward. Just to give you a sense, every week um, we're presenting data from, you know, the Thursday. So today is May 14th. So um, my, my team downloads this data from different sources, they crunch numbers, um, and then make these really amazing slides that I then get the the opportunity to present. And back on March 19th, you could see here, there was 230,000 Canadians who had, or sorry, uh, 300,000 people across the world who had tested positive uh, for COVID. Uh, this is data from John Hopkins University. Um, and you, you can see on this map, um, the number of people who have tested positive, the people who have died, those who have recovered. Uh, a week later, that numbers doubled to half a million people. Um, and then we've done so many that I don't have enough space to show every single week, not to mention the, the time it would take. Um, but um, we, looking at the last three weeks from April 30th, 3 million people. May 7th, last week when we did our, our webinar, 3.8 million people. And today, as of just before noon, 4.4 million people across the world have been diagnosed with, with COVID. And unfortunately, now over 300,000 people um, have died from the disease reported in 188 countries. Uh, this is a, a, a map that I, I, sh I started showing a few weeks ago because we got to the point where you could actually take John Hopkins uh, global data and start to look at which of the countries that are the hardest hit. And now there are 46 countries that have reported at least 10,000 cases. And what you're going to see here are countries that are green have reported one to 50 cases per 100,000. So this is standardized against the size of the country. So a country like the US, of course, is going to have more cases in Canada because it's a, a bigger country. So standardized against the size of the country, you can see that the yellow is 50 to 200 cases per 100,000. And the hardest hit countries are those who are reporting over 
200 cases per 100,000. Uh, and again, of, even of these green ones, these are countries now that are showing um, uh, more cases. You can see Russia's been in the news quite a bit, uh, and it's now jumped from gray to green and now is a yellow country. Canada now at 194 cases per 100,000. It's creeping up to that 200 um, case. Um, but really the hardest hit countries are those uh, in red. And you can see the top 11 that are over 200 cases per 100,000 um, here on the side. Um, now, what about Canada specifically? Um, this is data from Esri Canada. And you can see um, here that when we started on March 19th, there were 782 cases um, and uh, across the country. And then on the, the time that we jumped a week later, there was order over now 3,400 um, cases. Again, skipping a, a few webinars um, and out to April 30th, three weeks ago, 52,000 Canadians um, were diagnosed with COVID. Last week, the number was almost 64,000. And now we're at 72,500 individuals who have tested positive for COVID. And currently there are over 5,000 Canadians who have passed away from, from COVID. So specifically, um, if we look at um, the provinces, uh, these are cases um, per each province. So you can look to see where you're living and you can see the number of cases of people who have tested positive for COVID. Again, data uh, downloaded from Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, and you, you can see that Quebec and Ontario have the largest number of cases. Again, these are also very large uh, provinces. So now if we standardize these numbers against the size of the population, so we're looking at the number of cases per 100,000 people living in the province, we can see that Quebec continues to be the hardest hit province in the country uh, at 470 cases per 100,000. And again, if you remember the slide I showed you before about the world, Quebec is you know, as um, hard hit as any of the top 10 countries in the world. Um, Alberta, where I live, is up at 144 cases per 100,000, always seeming to equal that of on Ontario. Uh, we continue to see um, uh, Manitoba being uh, steadily at 20 cases per 100,000, although Saskatchewan has climbed up a little bit in the last few weeks. BC is kind of maintained in that 40 to 50 range. Uh, and in the Maritimes, you can see Nova Scotia being uh, the hardest hit um, province. So this is data from Statistics Canada. Um, and so Stephanie Coward uh, every uh, Thursday downloads this data. And what we're looking at here are the um, risk of bad things happening if you get diagnosed with COVID. Um, and you can see that from a Canadian perspective, 80% of Canadians who have been diagnosed with COVID have had uh, mild symptoms. And remember, this the denominator here is people who were diagnosed with um, COVID. The actual number of people who have been exposed to the virus and have not been sick enough to need to be tested is a large, larger number. So we expect that if we did a population screen, for example, if we looked at antibodies across the population, that this number actually would be higher. But among those who are COVID positive, we can see 11% end up in hospital, 3% in ICU, and our case fatality rate is 6% and climbing. And again, the reason why this number is a little bit higher than this number is because there are people who pass away at long-term care facilities um, who don't necessarily end up in hospital, or there are individuals who um, are elderly, they end up being hospitalized, but they don't accept you know, ICU care and, and so on like that. Now, if we stratify these outcomes by ages, we continue to see um, that children and adolescents are always doing well, and I re-emphasize this on a weekly basis, and I think this was um, also emphasized last week um, when we had eminent pediatric gastroenterologists from across North America talk to us about um, children and adolescents with um, IBD. Um, as you can see here, Canadians, you know, the vast majority of them who have been tested positive for COVID have done very, very well. Um, similarly, adults between the ages of 20 and 59 have actually done very well and the case fatality rate is less than 1%. And this is important because if you look at countries that are um, other countries of the Western world, like the United States, um, this age group has done worse than Canadians, um, higher rates of hospitalization, higher case fatality rates. 
as well. But of course, the most vulnerable population uh, in our society, as well as in every country across the world, is our elderly population, um, of which 20% end up in um, hospital, 4% uh, in ICU, and again, the case fatality rate is, is quite high. And, and again, when we talk about kind of risk stratified um, guidelines, it's this type of data that, that is um, affecting the decisions that the COVID task force is, is, is taking. All right, so I want to pivot a little bit to answering a few questions. And we, um, this past week, we accumulated a whole series of questions being asked over the past few weeks to look at the ones that haven't been answered adequately or the ones that were so common um, that uh, we wanted to kind of retackle them again. Uh, and so this is a question that I don't think we really answered, but I think is a fundamental question to think about as we think about some of the other questions that we're going to answer in the, in the future which is how long is the pandemic going to last? And to be frankly honest, nobody knows. Um, all we can do is look at what we have seen in history and see if we can extrapolate that information to what we're dealing with today. Um, but it's still an important exercise to do because when we're thinking about recommendations, when we're thinking about what we should be doing, we have to think about in the context of not what's gonna happen in, in one or two weeks or even one or two months, but maybe in the context of one or two years. And so I want to show three different scenarios that are being um, proposed. And this is data from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Um, it's a group that's out of the University of Minnesota and includes experts from like Harvard School of Public Health. These are infectious disease epidemiologists. Um, and, and they've actually published a, a really good report that I think is of high value to read. And the link's right here for anyone who wants to kind of read through the whole um, report. And what they've tried to do is say, okay, let's look back at previous pandemics and see what happened to them and, and what would it look like in our case in 2020 and 2021 if, um, you know, we followed the same patterns. And this is, was the pattern of the 1918-1919 pandemic, which was the last, you know, the most major pandemic in the last 100 years. And what you could see here, um, and so if you kind of, this is projecting out for December 2019 out to April 2022, and we are right now in this part right here where we have this first peak in the spring of 2020. And similarly, in 1918, there was a peak in the spring of, of uh, 1918. Now, what happened in the 1918 pandemic is that they had a large second wave. And it really was um, the fall of, two, of, sorry, of 1918 that you saw the highest number of cases um, and, uh, and, and bad outcomes occur. Um, it then leveled off. They had another kind of peak, not as bad as the uh, spring of, 2000, of 1918, but they had another one in the spring of 1919, and then it essentially petered out in the summer of 1919. And the whole idea of this concept of this large second peak is that you end up getting so many people infected um, that essentially you develop that herd immunity on a relatively short period of time. So by the time that 18 months has kind of passed, the, the virus has kind of um, gotten less uh, impactful in, in society. Now, this is any of these scenarios are possible, um, but we feel that this is probable, not a probable scenario because there's a lot of things that have happened in the last 100 years in medicine and in healthcare and in public health. We're now in a position where we know so much more information. All of the things that we've been doing in a, from a public health perspective is all designed to try to mitigate these types of curves. Um, and so we don't think that this is, we don't think we're going to necessarily follow the 1918 19 um, model. Um, another scenario might be this one, what's called peaks and valleys. And it's again, essentially, we have um, the where we are today in uh, in the spring of 2020. And then in the summer, we get a valley, things level off. And then in the fall, we get another one, and then it levels off. And then there's another peak. And you can see this wave. And, and this one, I think, if anyone looks at it, would be extremely frustrating, because if you look at this, you're, you'd start to think, well, maybe, you know, whatever is happening here to us right now over the last two months, we get relaxed and then, oh no, all of a sudden we're going to have the exact same things happen to us here. And then a few months later, it's going to happen again. And that's not necessarily the true reality of this type of scenario. The biggest difference between this peak and this peak is the time between the two and the knowledge that's gained and the ability to prepare and the fact that society has become accustomed to it. And so at, you know, at future peaks, we have better antiviral agents, we have better mechanisms to control things. A lot of the physical restrictions that we've been doing now have really just been there to buy time to get better tests, to get better preparation, to 
you know, stock up on PPE, things like that. So we'll be at a better position to fight this virus at this point in time, even if we end up seeing similar number of cases. The scenario that we're hoping to see um, is going to be this slow burn scenario. And that's really where the worst of it is behind us. But what we realize is that even as we get past this first wave, we haven't actually eradicated the virus. The only way that we essentially kind of get rid of this virus is if we have a vaccine against it or enough people are infected that they start to protect other people and, and we have less infections from person to person. In this scenario though, we constantly are seeing COVID cases um, month after month after month, but never at a point where it overwhelms the healthcare system. And again, knowledge is advancing month after month and we are ready and we're prepared. So the reason that I think this is important to show you these different scenarios and to recognize and to acknowledge that this is likely going to be a battle that we have over not months, but probably years, is that when we start to think about other questions and how we answer them and what recommendations we give you, we have to realize that these are things that are going to happen over the course of months, if not years. And so we need to balance the recommendations we give to you in the context of the reality of where the world is, is going. Um, and, and I'll come back to that um, when I answer some questions around physical distancing um, and, and risks of kind of going out into, into the community. Now, here's two questions that have been asked very uh, commonly. Uh, it's what do we know from cases of people with IBD who have gotten uh, the COVID virus? And what are the risks of COVID-19 for particular IBD medications? And I'm going to answer both of these questions um, by talking about the secure database. And if all goes well, technically, you should, everyone should be able to see this uh, website. And I will just ask my colleagues to, to text me if there's any issues of not being able to see um, the website. But I'm going to presume everyone can see it now. Um, and Erica just typed, looks good. Okay, good. Um, so this is um, the uh, secure uh, website. And, and just to preface, um, kind of reviewing the data on this uh, database, um, we actually had an entire webinar dedicated to the secure um, IBD registry. This is a registry of now over a thousand cases of individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease who have tested positive for um, COVID and their physicians have reported it into this registry. And you can see that they reported it from countries all over the world. Uh, essentially, um, you know, in North America and South America, Australia, Europe, Asia, um, all of these countries are, are reporting um, cases. Um, this uh, database, um, I've been um, fortunate to actually be a part of, and we actually are just just got our first paper except for publication in a journal called Gastroenterology uh, on the weekend. So um, we can start to share the, the data and people can actually scrutinize the data as, as well when they, they read the, the study. Um, my, one of the roles that my team has had um, was that we've actually developed this interactive web-based map that you can all go to at any point in time and you can actually um, see the data in real time. We update this every week. So this is updated for May 12th, earlier this week, a couple of days ago. Um, and this, this was all done by my um, uh, by Fox Underwood. Uh, she is um, a geographer that works in my research lab. And you can see here all the cases. And you can actually even click on uh, countries and you can see that you know Canada, we, there's 20 cases reported in Canada of uh, people of IBD, and one of those 20 cases have uh, died. And one thing you have to remember about, about cases that are death, we, we suspect that this is going to have a selection bias of reporting towards more sick people. And, and that's why we think that if you, if you had a sick case of IBD and, and they passed away or something bad happened to them, that is going to be a much more memorable case and that physician is much more likely to report this than people who are um, have had mild disease. Similarly, if you've had cases of IBD um, and you didn't get tested and but you had COVID, you, you wouldn't make it into this registry. So the first question is, who's kind of at that highest risk? And what we see here is you can see the number of people um, being diagnosed stratified by um, age groups. And you can see here that if you're under the age of 30, um, not a single child has died across the world from, from COVID. And the other um, outcomes that we look at here 
our hospitalizations and got getting into the ICU. And again, kids have done tremendously well, and including young adults between the ages of 20 or 30. And really kind of these red bad outcomes are only happening um, as you get older. But even between 30 and 60, and remember, this is all over the world, not just um, you know North America, where outcomes are probably a, a bit better than in countries that are, are poor. Um, you can see that most adults have done well as well. The group that is at highest risk is our elderly population, and each decade that you're older, the higher the risk is of um, dying or ending up in hospital or ending up in an ICU. And that's why when we shifted our recommendations, we've shifted them to being age-specific recommendations. So, um, and, and Eric will talk a little bit later on about um, the website and how we've uh, changed our recommendations uh, to accommodate the fact that um, the younger you are, the less likely you're going to be um, impacted. The other question that was asked was all around um, uh, treatments, and so who are people that are um, at risk relative to their drugs that they're on? And again, I can't go through every single drug, but the key things I just want to acknowledge is that we, even though a thousand cases is a lot, it's still not enough to really tease out a lot of good information. You need hundreds and hundreds of people uh, on a drug to really see if that drug has um, uh, a risk. So you can just turn around here, JAK inhibitor, that's tofacitinib, which is a very specialized drug for ulcerative colitis. We have very few cases, so we're not really able to report on that one. Whereas over here, you can see this is anti-TNF therapy. Um, and I apologize, this is written kind of for an academic um, audience, but anti-TNF therapy is Remicade, Humira, or the biosimilars of, of Remicade. Uh, and without 6-MP azathioprine methotrexate means that you're just on Remicade, Humira, or, or one of the Remicade biosimilars on its own. We can see that there's over 300 people who have been COVID positive on the on a, a drug like, uh, like Remicade or Humira, uh, and very few have had any bad outcomes. And when we did analyses comparing those who were on an anti-TNF agent against those who didn't have an anti-TNF agent, we saw no signals for increased risk. And that's led us to say that from a recommendations perspective, we actually feel that if you're on a drug like Remicade or Humira, um, your, your risk is likely no different than if you're not on it. And, and that's in part some of the reasons that we've kind of lessened a bit of the rules on the anti-TNF therapies and recognizing that we still have limited data. So we always want to be cautious in any of these recommendations, but this is definitely reassuring. And the biggest difference was when we started our, our task force nine, 10 weeks ago, um, we had none of this data to guide us. So this is now reassuring. And this data climbs, you can actually see the number of cases reported. The first one was on March 13th, and you can see how many Crohn's and ulcerative colitis cases have been reported ever since. And you can see that those numbers are going higher and higher. So as you get more cases, we'll get more data and we'll be able to update you um, as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that the one thing that we did see in this database was that if you were on high doses of prednisone and you had very active disease, that puts you at increased um, risk for bad outcomes. And really that's consistent with all of our recommendations going back 10 weeks ago. Um, essentially, um, if you're well in remission, whatever's keeping you in that state, you wanna stay on that drug and not stop it. Because the highest risk scenario is if you were to flare and need prednisone, that's when things um, become more uh, difficult. So I'm just gonna pivot back here. And um, what level of physical distance should I practice? And what are the recommendations for people with IBD as things begin to reopen? And really what these questions come down to is the provinces are starting to let people come out of their homes. Um, and you know what, to, to recommend for you to be home isolated um, when everyone was on a lockdown was a very easy recommendation. But we realize that we can't tell people necessarily that you know if you're 35 and you need to work and you can't necessarily home isolate for two years. Um, so we had to take that into consideration. And really what I do, and this is what I do with my patients and when I think about risks, I really think about this as a risk matrix. Um, and our personal risk is something that has to be developed between you and your physician, but we can give you a bit of guidance. And so if you're young, like remember the under the age of 20, we haven't seen bad outcomes at all, not in the IBD population, 
not in the general population. Similarly, if you're young and you're immunosuppressed, or you're on a drug like Remicade or Humira, um, you know, your risk is likely higher than somebody who's not on those drugs, but we still think that it's really low. Similarly, if you're an adult, your risk starts to go up of having a bad outcome with COVID. Um, and likely, if you're immunosuppressed, you're on a drug like Remicade or your drug like Humira, those risks are likely higher. But as I showed you from the secure database, we're not seeing strong signals that, that those risks are very, very high. The ones that we are seeing at the highest risk are people who are severely active and on prednisone. But remember, this is a reversible risk. You could be sick today, we could get you on treatment, and then you could be well in a month from now or eight weeks from now, and then all of a sudden your risk would then fall back to the yellow area. Of course, the toughest group are the people who are older, as I showed you the data, and it doesn't matter if you have IBD, if you don't, if you're an older individual and you get exposed to COVID, your risk is going to be higher, and this is the population that we need to protect. And the older you are, the higher the risk. If you're in your 80s, it's a, it's a higher risk than if you're in your 60s, and if you have other um, chronic comorbidities like heart disease and lung disease, it's that risk becomes higher as well. And then you've got to then balance it against personal hardship. So if you're an older individual and you're retired and you don't, you know, you're financially set, it's a lot easier for you to stay home than if you're in your 30s, uh, you're the single breadwinner for your family. Uh, and if you don't work, you you end up, you know, losing your economic viability, that hardship is much harder there. And so I kind of think about this as kind of an escalating hardship. And this is relatively simplified for an example, but you can see here if you are, if you have somebody who is at higher risk, but you have the capacity to either, you know, to work from home, your job allows that, well then that's an easier hardship than somebody whose job they can't work from home with. And then if you can't work from home with, there are certain jobs where there's lowest exposure at your work. So for example, you might work in an office building where there's tremendous physical distancing, people are wearing masks, um, the, the, employment, the type of work you do is, is in an office or a cubicle, so you can kind of keep yourself away from people. Well, that's different than if you're in a high ex exposure risk, such as being a frontline healthcare provider, working in an emergency department, or if you're in, you drive an Uber and you don't know who's coming into the back of your car, or if you work, you know, as a teller in a, a grocery supermarket. So when you start thinking about this matrix, you have to ask yourself, where are you? And again, this part, this personal risk is a little bit based on you and your doctor talking about it. But if your personal risk is relatively low um, and you have flexibility in what you do, then I just argue take extra precautions. Um, you can, if you have the option of working from home or working in an office, and you have that flexibility, even if your risk is low, well, why don't you work from home because you're just taking that little extra precaution, um, a bit more than, than the average person who doesn't necessarily have IBD and on a drug like Humira, but you're just doing that little extra more. If you're, you're, um, you have a greater hardship, you have to do things that are hard, but your risk is low, well then just follow what the public health is telling you to do. And as the provinces open up things, you can follow them just like the rest of society because your risk level is on the low side. If your risk is on the high side of things, and that's kind of if you're elderly or you're actively sick, if it's feasible and easy, then clearly home isolation is important. And, and again, and this is can be called relative home isolation. People can still um, you know, walk outside, things like that. You just wanna be careful of, of being exposed and contracting. On the flip side of that is if you're at a higher risk and you're having a lot of hardship in what you do, personal decisions, well, it becomes a personal decision of, of what you do, whether you continue a certain job, whether you continue to take certain risks. Um, to give you a personal example, I have asthma. I've also had lung collapses on both my lungs when I was younger. And and I, even though I don't have IBD and I'm not immunocompromised, I recognize that as a frontline healthcare provider, somebody who's going to be working um, in, um, in like I'm on call this weekend at the hospital, that I'm putting myself at higher risk by doing that job, but I'm making that personal decision uh, around all of, you know, of who I am, what I'm doing. And because of that, you know, I'm, I'm going forward in, in, in doing this, this work. Um, so with that, and I, I apologize, I, I didn't actually think I would be talking this long, I, um, but I, I do want to bring in um, Eric, and I just want to, as Eric kind of comes in on, on board, just kind of highlight the fact that, um, you know, there was a time before COVID that we were hanging out 
watching a baseball game, the Blue Jays is a few years back. Um, and we are both looking forward to the world getting back to this point. Um, it may not happen in the next days, weeks, months. It may be a bit longer for us, um, but we are going to be here answering your questions until we get back to this point. So I'm just going to sh stop sharing my screen here. Um, and um, let me see. I so I, we'll take some questions. Um, I don't want to show my screen quite yet. Uh, why don't we start with some questions, and then as we take some questions, we'll uh, we'll show the website and show uh, you know where we can where you might be able to find some of the answers on the website. Um, so we'll start off with question one, which I mean I can take or you can take. Gil, I know we were actually talking just today about this question uh, with Dr. Xiao by email because uh, some new developments have come out. So the question came from the audience: Is there any new evidence of COVID affecting pregnancy? in people with Crohn's or the general population. So when Dr. Xiao and Dr. Pham Hui presented on this topic, on sort of matern mothers and newborns with, with uh, IBD and COVID and what was happening, that was, I think, week two, um, you know, there really wasn't much evidence, but there were some reports from China that COVID did not seem to affect pregnant women any more severely than other women of the same age and that it didn't seem to get transmitted uh, through pregnancy. Uh, certainly, we knew that if a mother was actively infected and coughing, and that could infect the baby, but we didn't think it was being transmitted through pregnancy. Uh, Gil, do you want to talk about some of the new studies that just came out? Yeah, well, so um, there's just been recent, recent um, case reports um, where there has been evidence of what we call vertical transmission. So if you're pregnant and you have active COVID uh, and you have pregnant and you have a and you deliver a baby, there's been case reports um, where the the COVID was actually discovered in, in the newborn um, as well. Uh, and again, when we say case reports, that means that um, in the world of experience, um, all of the physicians around the world are trying to look for unique patterns. And anytime something unique happens, we, we report that um, and, and we start to learn from it. Um, but it means that there's only been a handful of cases out of the whole world, which means there have been, the vast majority of pregnancies have been in women who have not had COVID and we haven't seen any issues. Um, there have been women who have had COVID, had pregnancy and have not had vertical transmission. And now we're identifying that there is the potential that that can, ha can happen. Uh, and, and what that means is, I mean, obviously you, we have less control in terms of timing of pregnancies, deliveries, and in and, and that, but it means that the healthcare system has to be prepared for that knowledge and has to be um, set up in such a way to protect everyone in that pregnancy unit from the healthcare providers, the physician, the nurse who's doing the delivery, to the mother, to the partner who is beside the mother, to the fetus that is born. And, and Eric, maybe as a pediatrician, I'm, I'm wondering if you can give a sense of what would happen in that kind of scenario if somebody, and again, these are very rare scenarios, but if somebody did have um, COVID and, and the baby was born in, in that scenario, what, what would happen um, from a healthcare perspective um, to in the neonatal unit? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing to just make note of is even in these cases of vertical transmission, the babies did fine. Uh, there was no, you know, birth defects and there's been no reports of any birth defects when mother gets it while she's pregnant. And in these, in the two cases that I'm aware of, one from China and one from Toronto, actually, uh, in both cases, the baby was asymptomatic. So the only reason they knew that the baby had COVID infected in the womb was because they did antibodies on the baby and those antibodies wouldn't show up until three to seven days after the baby was infected, which is when the baby was still in the womb. We know some of the problems with those antibody tests. You probably heard on the news, they're not perfect tests. So we don't know for sure this is the case, but the good news is that the babies were asymptomatic and did fine. Uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society is recommending that, you know, the baby continue to breastfeed and we just uh, enact protective measures, meaning masks, gowns, gloves, uh, the mother would be in an isolation room uh, and, you know, so the baby would be protected from, uh, you know, actively being coughed on 
but we would still continue to breastfeed and we would still continue to do as much as we could to you know have a normal newborn experience and and normal newborn growth and bonding with the mother uh, so for right now anyway i don't think too too much has changed compared to when we talked about this at week two that you know we can still allow the baby to do all the normal baby things and just basically watch carefully i think is the bottom line so these two case reports really recommended that if the mother is infected uh, with covid19 with the sars cov2 cov2 virus um, that we just watch the baby we do special testing at birth of blood umbilical cord blood uh, and placenta to see whether there, there was virus in those samples and then watch the baby carefully and so, Eric, the second question, um, it says recommendations for protection against COVID uh, in a workplace where physical distance is not always possible. Should we wear protective gear or avoid returning to work? I, I mean, I was covered those that topic, you know, broadly when I talked about the risk matrix and the personal risks against the feasibility of, of your workplace. I'm just curious to get your perspective on, you know, additional comments from, from what I said earlier. Yeah, no, I mean, I saw. I think this is really covered in on the website quite a bit, and it's it's the uh, return to work and school guidelines. So now I'll I'll ch I'll share my my screen if I can. Uh, let's see what I can do here. Show my screen, and then we'll pull up the Crohn's and Colitis website. So if you go to the Crohn's and Colitis.ca website, uh, you'll see the the COVID nineteen section, and then go down to guidance. And uh, way at the bottom is reopening of schools and the economy. And that's where you'll find information about back to school, back to work, and what sort of recommendations we've made. And they are, as Gil mentioned, age-based. Uh, so if it's back to school, back to work, assuming there's no severe inflammation and not on steroids, high dose steroids, then back to school is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and if the child is actively inflamed or on steroids, the parents, the, the family members anyway, should do all of these things. And this actually brings to point one of the other questions, which was if I'm immunosuppressed, taking multiple immunosuppressive agents, and I live with multiple family members that are still working outside the home, what should I do, to, what should they do to protect me? Uh, and this is where the recommendations are. They're here that if uh, your household member good hand hygiene, washing your hands for 20 to 30 seconds as soon as you walk through the door, or even outside would be better with, with uh, hand sanitizer, social distance, physical distancing, if possible, of other family members uh, who might be outside the home, adhere to uh, public health guidelines of saying, trying to stay two meters apart, avoiding in-person meetings and so on, use services for vulnerable people, and clean the residents as best as possible to avoid transmission. And that's where the Centers for Disease Control guidelines come in, which are shown here. You can click the link to see about cleaning and disinfecting the house as often as you possibly can. Uh, and then back to work here for adults. Really, the guidance is the same. So if you're not on high dose steroids, if you're not having severe inflammation or moderate to severe malnutrition, we can talk about what that means in a second. Uh, you're fairly safe to work outside the home. Personally, I would recommend wearing a mask. Uh, I think two things that the mask does is it may protect other people, so protect you from coughing or sneezing uh, or uh, you know spreading saliva around to other people. But also, very importantly, it protects you to a certain extent because it prevents you from touching your mouth. Uh, and if you want to wear a, a visor on your eyes, it also that will protect you from touching your eyes. So uh, you know it prevents you from going constantly touching your face and touching your mouth and things like that. So good idea to wear a mask if you're able to at work. Uh, but essentially, otherwise, those instructions are all here and you can read about them. The seniors is a little bit more difficult, obviously, because of the risk of, of serious COVID-19 and hospitalization and death in seniors. And so I think, again, that's what Gil talked about in terms of assessing what your risk is and deciding what your risk tolerance is. Uh, deciding what you're able to do and maybe what you can avoid doing. Yeah, and then one of the questions, and Eric, you, you touched on it a little bit, was this whole concept of um, how do we define malnourishment? Um, how, how would I know that as a patient? Is it something I have to speak to a doctor about? And the short answer is it, that from a true kind of medical definition of malnourishment, um, that is something that um, 
you would want to speak to your doctor about. There's a few scenarios where malnourishment happens. Um, I can speak about it in the adult population. So one scenario is there are some patients with Crohn's disease, for example, have had multiple surgeries of their small bowel, and you only have a finite amount of small bowel, and if you lose too much of your small bowel, you can get into a situation where you get what is called a short gut syndrome, and it literally is a short gut, like you have less um, bowel, less surface area to absorb nutrients, uh, and then you can potentially be um, uh, malnourished in that state. Some people in the extremes of that are actually have um, supplemental feeding through tubes or through uh, an intravenous, um, we call that parental nutrition. And in those scenarios, being mal malnourished, there's still a relative level of mal malnourishment. If you're followed by an enteral nutrition program clinic and they've got everything up to speed and you're feeling well, you're, you're not necessarily malnourished, but you're at higher risk for malnourishment. The other scenario are people who are very sick. I mean, most people on, on the webinar would know that, you know, when you've had a flare and you lose your appetite and your caloric needs increase when you're super sick, um, it's very easy to get um, malnourished in that state. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we've identified people who are actively unwell with their disease, they're flaring actively, that they're at a, at a higher risk, not just because of drugs like prednisone, but also because they're probably relatively mal malnourished. And again, um, you know, I'm sure Eric has a dietitian in, in his IBD clinic like we do. We work really closely um, with our um, our patient populations with our, our, our local dietitian to help make sure we can minimize malnourishment um, in, in all states. Um, Eric, and from a uh, kid perspective, a pediatric perspective, yeah. any differences that you would? Not really. I mean, you know, I think it's ex first. It's I think it's important to note that we're talking about moderate to severe malnourished. A little bit underweight is probably not going to impede your body's ability to fight infections. And also being malnourished has been well described, uh, you know, impeding your immune system for all sorts of different infections uh, from bacteria to viruses to other things. So it's not a good state to be in no matter what. But I agree that I think it's important to speak to your doctor or your dietitian if you have one about this. Uh, the dietitians have good ways of measuring whether or not you're malnourished, whether it's how thick your skin is in a certain area of body or the circumference of your arms or other parts of your body to determine whether you're truly malnourished um, and can calculate what your energy expenditure is and other things to, to, to calculate what kind of calories you need to, to take in. So that's you know certainly one of the advantages of being in an IBD clinic where you've got multidisciplinary care and you've got nurses and dietitians and other, other care providers who can do that for you. Um, I think for the most part, you probably would have heard if your doctor was worried that you were malnourished, I, I would suspect your doctor would have told you that. So in general, I mean, I think a little bit underweight is not what we're talking about here. And then uh, question number five is when someone finishes tapering off prednisone, would they still be in the high risk category for a certain period of time? So just to give you a bit of context of where all of this prednisone came from. So this actually predated any data that we had in the IBD um, community. What happened was in China, where the epicenter started, um, what happens is there are people who, most people get a fever and a cough and, and they recover at home. Then a subset, and, and the early numbers showed it was roughly around 20%, end up being hospitalized. And of those who end up in hospitalized, they end up hospitalized because the um, infection goes into the lungs uh, and causes difficulty breathing and low oxygen levels in the blood. Um, and a subset of them develop what's called an inflammatory response to their lungs. So it's not so much even the virus attacking their lungs, but it's their immune system overreacting and attacking the lungs. And that leads to, um, some people call this a cytokine, cytokine storm, which means that there's a huge inflammatory response. There's a condition called ARDS, which is where your lung fills with fluid because of this inflammatory response. And that's when ends up people who have very difficulty breathing and they need to be in an intensive care unit on a ventilator to breathe. And so a number of different, um, different anti-immune system therapies have been tried to help that specific group, the people who have gotten sick enough to end up needing to be in an ICU setting. And so early on, they tried prednisone because prednisone is an anti-inflammatory and it settles down inflammation. Anyone who's been on prednisone because of a flare recognized that's why we, pre we prescribe it. But in that population, the people who were given prednisone did worse. Uh, they didn't necessarily have IBD. They were actually given the prednisone to treat their lung condition and things got worse. So that gave us the first signal that this there, there could potentially be harm. And because of that, 
from a state of caution, we, we right, right back eight, 10 weeks ago said, you know, we should be avoiding um, minimizing the exposure to prednisone. The data from the secure IVD registry, which I showed you earlier, also confirms that people who are on prednisone are more likely to have a bad outcome than those who are not on it. And similarly, there's an analogous rheumatology registry, very similar to the IBD one that I showed you, um, that looks at conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, which also uses many of the same drugs that IBD patients have. Uh, and in that registry, they've also shown that prednisone is a risk for rheumatoid arthritis patients. So I think there's a consistency in the data to suggest that um, prednisone is, is a risk factor. Now, there is a, uh, a specific dose effect to it. And we think that this high dose prednisone is the highest risk. And the cutoff that we've identified is around 20 milligrams. So above 20 milligrams, what we're trying to do is to reduce that dose. You, know, you can't stop prednisone outright because your body's um, prednisone is essentially cortisol. And if you were to stop it, you become cortisol deficient and you can get really sick from that. So what we're trying to do is taper down. And in the inability to be able to get you down off of the prednisone, that's where we like to use the word shielding. And what does shielding mean? It means being home isolated and not only protected from the outside world, but also shielded in your home. And that would be the scenario where you would want to be very careful about your other members of your family who could potentially be sick coming there. So they want to be taking those precautions to minimize your risk if you're on prednisone, because the truth is during this pandemic, people are going to still need to be prescribed prednisone. They're very sick if they're very sick with their IBD. And so we have to balance these, these risks of the IBD against the potential risk of COVID. So once you get down below 20 milligrams, we do believe that those risks drop. And it's a combination of getting lower and off of the prednisone and that you get better as well. And so the key is that we're using another therapy to reduce the dose of the prednisone. Um, and that other therapy, whether it be Remicade, Humira, Stellara, Zelgens, uh, Vitaluzumab, and Tivio, all the different drugs that are, are at our disposal, we're using those to get you off of the steroids and those other drugs we are not seeing signals that they have the same harm that prednisone has. Hopefully that makes sense. Absolutely. And I have to say we're we're almost at eight o'clock, but I think we'll stay a little bit longer if people are interested. Uh, and just to finish answering the questions that are out there, yeah. Um, no, 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 it's not your fault. It's not your fault. We were all interested in what you had to say, Gil, don't worry. <laughs> Um, but there's some great questions and I'd, I'd hate to leave them unanswered. Um, so I'll, I'll ask you the next question, Gil. Um, is there any new information about anti-TNF medications having protective effects against contracting COVID-19 or the virus severity? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So it comes back to that whole concept of that cytokine storm that we talked about before. So there are trials going on right now all across the world where people are using different types of anti-inflammatory type medications, many of them being monoclonal antibodies that block specific parts of the immune system, just like the biologics that many of the people um, who are watching this are currently on. Um, and again, it's they're not they're not using it, for example, to prevent you from getting COVID or if you have mild disease. It's really in this in the sickest population. Um, we don't yet have data um, from those trials to know that being on a on a drug um, uh, works. That th that's information that we're waiting for. Um, but what we're trying to do from, you know, data like from the secure registry is to look to see once we have large enough numbers, we might actually start to see signals with some of the specialized um, immune blocking medications we have. If we started to see that there was a potential, not only just a, a neutral effect, but potentially a protective effect, that wouldn't necessarily mean that that drug was protecting people, but maybe we could give us a clue that we could design a randomized control study with that drug in that specific scenario. So the truth is it's still too soon to know, um, but that data is emerging. And I just go back to kind of the scenarios where I showed you all the different peaks that were happening. I suspect in peak two or peak three, you know, months and months down the road, the big difference is that we're gonna have drugs like that at our disposal to use so that the risk of having a bad outcome six months from now, I feel is going to be much, much less than it is today. And then, um, and then there's a question here about where would you fall if you're an adult, but I'm going to say an adult or a child, um, immune suppressed, but also have under other underlying issues like respiratory problems. So for example, Eric, maybe I'll just change a little bit for, for you. If, if there was a child who had type one diabetes, and also inflammatory bowel disease, and they were on a, a drug like a biologic, what, how, how does that change your risk paradigm? 
Well, I mean, I think with type 1 diabetes, it might not be the best of examples because it depends on what their control of their diabetes is, right? Just as with IBD, if your diabetes is well controlled and your hemoglobin A1C is great, I'm less worried than if your diabetes is out of control and you're at risk of going into ketoacidosis or something. But I think a, a, an even better example might be uh, asthma, severe asthma, or other lung diseases like cystic fibrosis. Uh, I'd be worried, right? And I think that as the pediatric gastroenterologist, I would be working with the respirologist or the endocrinologist or the other specialists that are involved in the care of this child to start to develop, you know, almost a custom personalized risk matrix to say, you know, how risky is it for your child to go to school at this point? And I think the same goes for adults. I mean, you, you kind of implied this yourself, Gil, that Although you're you're young and fairly healthy, you have this risk of asthma and you have this history of lung problems. And so you, while you've made a decision to go to work, you know, it's perfectly acceptable that if somebody with a similar situation decides not to go to work. And I'd say that those people who have these multiple risk factors might want to discuss it with their physicians. And while, you know, if, if the IBD is under control and they're not on uh, steroids and they're feeling well, that your gastroenterologist may say, well, you better speak to your respirologist and see what they say first. So we should all be working together to figure out what's safe and what's not for the for for you as a patient, individual patient. Yeah, and I think the answer that you gave was exactly the same that I would say for for adults, whether it be diabetes, it comes down to are you well controlled or are you out of control? Similarly, there are, are fixed conditions and there are variable conditions. So asthma is a variable condition. We can get that under control working as a team with your respirologist so that you could be well, feeling well, and, and being and your risk being low. If you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, that's a fixed defect. That's something that we can't get the lungs better. And we know that, that if you were to expose to a virus, whether it be influenza or COVID, your risk is much, is much, much higher. And, and that's where that creating that personal risk with your physician helps you kind of navigate those decisions for you. Absolutely. The next question, Gil, I think is a really interesting one. It's a bit of a scary one, I think, for patients because they, I think they noticed on the Secure IBD website and on your graphs that the five ASA medic medicines, uh, mesalamine or sulfasalazine or other medicines like that, people on those medicines seem to have a higher risk of death. Um, and I know this is something that you addressed in the paper that you just had accepted. Can you talk a little bit about why that might be? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's such a good question and I'm glad someone asked it so they have an opportunity to answer it. So first of all, we, we have to think about the methodology of, of these types of studies um, and not just the specific registry, but a lot of type of work that both Eric and I do. There are potential flaws in designs of studies that sometimes bring out um, associations or relationships that may or may not be true. Um, and, and you see a lot of this with the COVID literature. You, you see on Twitter or even the news media, something comes out. Like, for example, there was a, a recent um, article that said if you smoke, you were protected against um, getting um, bad outcomes of COVID. That was published in the news. And some very smart epidemiologists actually t went through the paper that was unpublished and actually went and said, you know what, here, here are some of these methodological flaws that actually would explain why they're seeing these findings. And so every time that we see a relationship, we always have to ask the question, is it biologically plausible? Is this, does this make sense? Um, and so mesalamine drugs like Pentaza, Acicol, Mesavant, Salifog that we use quite commonly to treat, particularly ulcerative colitis, um, less so Crohn's disease, um, but for the most part, ulcerative colitis, are topical immune suppressants, meaning they suppress the immune response in the bowel, but they don't suppress your immune system systemically. We've known that for a huge number of studies. So there's actually no kind of biological reason to think that a drug like Pentaza would actually put you at a higher risk of developing um, a bad outcome from COVID. So then the question is, why would a study like this actually show something like that? Well, the answer is, and what we think the answer is, is that this was a global study. This was a study that was done all across the world. So we have people who are from North America where they have access to some of the best care physicians, the best drugs like Remicade and Intivio and Humira and Stellara um, and Zelgens. And, and in, it also comes from countries in much poorer countries where you still get inflammatory bowel disease, but access to care, access to drugs is a lot 
poor. And we know in those countries, they use a lot more of the mesalamine drugs, the drugs like Pantaza, Acicult, Mezavan. Just the access to those drugs are much cheaper. They're easier to access. We've seen in our database that a lot of people who are on Crohn's disease were getting these medications. And in North America, we actually use a lot less of this than in Crohn's disease. And so what we're thinking is that in these countries where you don't have access to the best care and they don't have access to the best drugs, um, you may also not have the best access to care for your COVID if, you're, if, you, get a, if you get sick from it. Um, and we think that those things are correlated uh, together. And so we see that this has happened more commonly, this drug is prescribed more commonly in poorer countries. And also we saw that it's prescribed more commonly in our older population where many physicians might be nervous to use a drug that suppresses your immune system. And so they may actually be suboptimally treating them with a drug like Pentaza, where really they should have been using a drug like Intivio instead. And so this is where, this is what we explained in, in, in the paper. Um, having said that, um, you know, it's piqued our interest and we are doing a series of different studies trying to understand, you know, exactly is this truly a risk or not. But right now, based on our understanding of where this data comes from and just the does it make sense kind of bar, um, we don't feel that a drug like Pentaza increases your risk of a bad outcome. That's great. And I always like to show this. I'm hoping that people can see my screen right now. Uh, this graph, uh, the classic graph, right, that an epidemiologist will show to the public to explain that correlation does not equal causation. And this graph shows that there's high correlation between uh, years that a Nicolas Cage film came out and the number of drownings in the United States. Clearly, well, you could argue maybe Nicolas Cage shouldn't be making any more movies and then we'd have fewer drowning, but that's not the case. Uh, there's other reasons maybe Nicolas Cage shouldn't be making any more movies, but uh, clearly this is a correlation, but it's not cause and effect. There's other things that could explain this association. And so it's important that uh, you know people understand that this may not be an issue of the, the drug itself here. It may be an indicator of some other health services effect or health system effect. I just want to add that I think Nicolas Cage is being casted as the Tiger King. So uh, we may see more yeah. drowning in the U.S. once yeah. that show comes out. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question to you, Eric. Um, it's actually a very good question. It's very topical. It's, I'm actually really, you know, it really this, the questions that we get today and all, all along really reflects how educated and up to speed our, the IBD community is. Um, and so the question here is there more information regarding the pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome, the Kawasaki disease that is potentially associated with COVID-19 in children. And I wonder if you wanted, that's relatively new data as well. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, this is a scary thing for a pediatrician and for a parent uh, hearing that, you know, up until now, we really felt that kids did very well with COVID-19 and tended not to get sick, almost never needed hospitalization and almost nobody died as a child because of COVID-19. And then this comes out. Um, so these were cases that initially, I think New York City and area reported about 100 cases. And now we just had a published report in The Lancet uh, yesterday from Italy, which looked at something called Kawasaki disease. And this was a Kawasaki-like illness. Kawasaki disease is a very well-known pediatric illness. It's not common but it's an immune system disease that's usually triggered by an infection, we think, although we don't always know what that infection was. Uh, and it results in an inflammatory state, not unlike IBD. Um, it's sort of triggered by something that sets off the immune system and the immune system produces inflammation and that causes damage to your body. In this case, the immune system is reacting and causing a vasculitis, which means inflammation of the blood vessels. And uh, we're very good as pediatricians in treating, identifying Kawasaki disease, which there's no test for it. It's really identifying the symptoms of it, like uh, having red eyes, having peeling hands or feet, having a rash and having a fever lasting longer than five days. Um, and we can treat it. We, we use medicines, uh, we use immunoglobulins, actually intravenous immunoglobulins uh, to boost almost your immune system. And it helps prevent the complications of Kawasaki disease, which can include coronary artery aneurysm uh, and inflammation of, of your coronary vessels, your blood vessels of your heart. So what they've found with COVID-19 is there seems to be uh, an increased risk of something that looks like Kawasaki disease. So it's Kawasaki disease-like illness. It's a systemic inflammatory disease. 
it has similar features like the coronary artery problems and the red eyes and the rash and the fever, but it also results in almost a toxic shock where your body shuts down, your blood pressure drops, and you get very, very sick, and the child gets very, very sick and, and can die from it. Um, and so this Italian study that came out yesterday found that the rate of what looked like Kawasaki disease jumped very, very high during the time that COVID was uh, very prevalent in Northern Italy and uh, much higher than it had been in the year prior, uh, implying that COVID may be related. And, and similarly, we've seen that in Montreal and we've seen that in New York, that uh, there are case series of these kids who get very sick with this, this vasculitis illness, this, this Kawasaki-like illness. Um, it's still very rare. It's still very, very uncommon. Again, you saw the, the graph that Gil produced that uh, most children, 98% of them don't need to be hospitalized. You know, very few, if any, have died in Canada. Um, and so, and, and you know, so it's not something to panic about, but it's, it, it, I think it's an indication that we know very little about this virus and the effects that this virus has on the body. And we need to be really, really cautious with uh, treating it lightly. I'm not saying that we shouldn't slowly reopen. I think we all agree that you know, the economy has to reopen. This is gonna be a long-term thing, but we can't say for sure that all children will be fine. Uh, it's not the flu, it's something else, and we don't understand it yet. Uh, we don't quite understand how to treat it. We don't know how to prevent it, and we have to be really careful. Uh, so, you know, that all to say, don't be too scared about it. It's very rare. Make sure your kids wash their hands really well. Make sure if they're going to be back in school, if you're in Quebec, really, if you're going to be back in school, uh, that they wear a mask if possible, that they stay six feet or two meters away from their friends uh, and that they come home and they wash their hands really well. But beyond that, we're still learning all about this. Yeah. And the only thing I would, I would add is that, um, you know, this is a new disease. And so we, we're going to learn new things week to week. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar because on a weekly basis, because we know that if we were to come back a, a month from now, um, we would essentially leave the community in an abyss without that extra knowledge. Um, and so we're, we're working on this, but it's not just us alone. There is a huge outpouring of research from the entire world. Um, the Canadian government uh, just announced uh, over a billion dollars in funding related to, to COVID-related research, including our, our Canadian Institutes of Health Research, CHR, uh, is a big, the number one national funding agency for health research, and they just launched a COVID-specific grant competition that Eric and I put in um, a grant application to study COVID in the IVD community. Um, to try to un answer some of the key questions that you've been asking. Again, we don't know if we're going to get funded or not because there's, I think, 2,000 applications that are all there, but it just shows you, you know, if we didn't get funded, it means that there's X number of studies being done by brilliant people across the country that have ideas even better than Eric and I. Um, and that just shows you there is a tremendous amount of effort going towards trying to answer the questions that you're having. Absolutely. There was a question here about ostomies, ileostomies. Um, any increased risk in those patients? Yeah, so if you have an ileostomy, so that's essentially um, your small bowel coming out into your abdomen and then, and then your contents going into a bag, there is no increased risk of just having an ostomy in terms of contracting COVID or in terms of having bad outcomes. Um, where the risk potentially happens if you have an ostomy is in relationship to disease activity. So if you have active inflammation in your small bowel, just like if you had active inflammation and you didn't have an ostomy, your, your risk would be higher. And people with ostomy sometimes have a higher propensity to get dehydrated because they don't have their colon to kind of suck up the water. And so they sometimes, when they get a flare, they can sometimes get dehydrated, run into kidney problems, sometimes need to be supported in, in hospital. So it's not so much that the virus itself would necessarily cause greater harm from ostomy. It's just that you have to have greater care for your health system. And similarly, when I was talking earlier about that short gut syndrome, if you have an ostomy and you've had multiple surgeries and you've lost a lot of your, your small bowel, your susceptibility, whether it's to a flare or if you have a, even just a gastrointestinal illness or whatever cause of, of, uh, of an infection is gonna, be, is gonna be higher in those scenarios. And then I think, oh, and then Eric, there is, should I attend appointments with my healthcare professional? 
Um, and then secondarily, um, are the infusion clinics uh, there to keep us safe? Maybe, maybe if you wanted to focus particularly on the healthcare and uh, professional question, because um, you know we had the webinar around telehealth uh, a few weeks back. Yeah. So I mean, I'll I'll deal with both questions. I think they're both excellent questions. Um, so I mean, I think most healthcare providers still uh, to this day are really trying to do the visits virtually if they can. So that could be by telephone or it could be by video conference. So certainly if uh, your appointment is shift to, shifted to a, a virtual means of, of, of seeing you, then please take that appointment. If you're worried that you're sick and your message is not getting across by telephone, then make sure you say something to your doctor or to your nurse. Uh, and they will see you, for the most part, they'll try to see you in clinic if they need to. Be aware that obviously seeing you virtually is not the same thing as feeling your belly and having a look at you and, and you know doing blood work and doing all those things. But uh, if you go back to one of the previous webinar from two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Wang uh, really went into good depth about how we can see patients virtually and do a good job and still monitor for inflammation and things like that. Um, if your doctor is telling you to come into clinic, maybe there's a reason. You can ask why, like why do I need to be there in person? Um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're doing our best to keep patients safe. Certainly there are fewer patients than there have ever been in the hospitals and the clinics. And so I think as long as you're physically distanced from other people, as long as you wash your hands really well, wear a mask, uh, you'll be okay if you have to go in to see your doctor or need blood work or any tests or anything like that. Uh, as far as the, the infusion clinics go, I'm going to share my screen again. I want to uh, try to emphasize that a lot of this is on the website. Uh, if you go here on the on the right hand side, there's uh, this this navigation bar, and you can go to the FAQs, the frequently asked questions, and there is information there about what infusion clinics are doing to try to keep you safe when you go. Uh, I'll have to try to find it here if I can, but it's here somewhere. Uh, essentially, they are doing an excellent job at really. Uh, trying to keep uh, this is the different. This is not the COVID-19 infusion uh, FAQ. So I apologize. Uh, it's here somewhere. There we go. Get answers. I think maybe. Gil, help me out. Live demo never works properly. There we go. This is it. So lots of frequently asked questions, and here it is. Is it safe to visit my infusion clinic? Uh, and there's information there. But essentially, the infusion clinics are doing a very good job at making sure that you're physically distancing making sure that um, the nurses are using protective equipment so that they're not infecting you and you're not infecting them. And that does mean that they can probably see fewer patients uh, frequency per hour. But, and so that means that your, your appointment might be shifted at a time that might be not as convenient for you. So please be patient with any appointment shifts, but they're making those changes because they wanna keep as few people as possible in the clinic and make sure everybody is six feet, in, six feet apart and so on. So in general, I, I think that yes, it is safe to visit the infusion clinics. Uh, it's safer to continue your biologic than to skip or miss doses. So please do that. You can speak to your doctor about doing a rapid infusion. So in sort of just over an hour, instead of just over two hours, that will kind of get you out quicker and, and make you safer. If you're getting the injectable form of a biologic and you're going to the infusion clinic to do that, speak to your biologic patient services programs. Uh, a lot of them are now offering training virtually uh, by video conference to show you uh, how to inject yourself at home if you feel, if you feel comfortable doing that. Uh, I think that's worthwhile to keep you out of the infusion clinic and keep you at home as much as possible. Yeah, and another thing I would add is that um, addressing the infusion clinic was one of the first things that we did as a COVID task force. Um, in fact, our second webinar on March 26, we invited the executive heads of the four major infusion networks in the country uh, Inamar, Inviva, Cloverdale, and Bayshore to come in to talk to um, the IBD community to express all the things that they were doing um, to make those infusion centers safe for them. And so that's actually, it's a, that, that's conversations that is on the website that Eric showed. And just to give you a bit of the backstory to that, um, you know, at the time, the infusion centers were not deemed an essential service. And what that means then in a, in a lockdown scenario, if you're not an essential service, you have to shut down. And in that setting, you know, nurses couldn't work in those clinics, patients couldn't go to there. And so that was a huge crisis point that we identified in the task force and worked with CCC. And that's where we brought in um, to ask 
these questions and we realized that many of the provinces had not deemed it. Um, the CCC then advocated with the different health authorities um, in each of the different provinces working with the infusion clinics and within a week every province had deemed the infusion clinics an essential service which meant that if the lockdown were to then come, and remember this was before we had all of the you know, school closures and everything happening, um, that those infusion centers would not closed down and the nurses working at them would not be redeployed into hospitals and so on. So that was a huge effort of the task force right at the beginning, um, but then it didn't end there. Then the next question was, if those who are getting infusions probably recognize that, you know, back in 2019, those chairs were not two meters apart. And so then we had to figure out what are the ways to screen people to make sure that we're not allowing people who are potentially sick with COVID to go into infusion centers. We need to make sure that those chairs were spaced properly. We need to make sure that the uh, nurses who were caring for those patients had the proper PPE and they had enough supply. Um, and again, this was right on the radar for each of the infusion networks. The key was integrated work between the four of them, you know, supported by our task force to give kind of medical direction. And we were able to address virtually every single issue that came up in relationship to the infusion centers. And I think that's actually one of our early wins from the task force. Absolutely. All right. So we have time for a few more. Uh, we'll try to go as quick as we can. This isn't a quick one. This is not an easy one. Actually, Gail, I'm going to throw this one to you, of course. Uh, are there ways to strengthen my immune system? Um, so first of all, um, we were just before this conversation, um, Eric and I with Nina and Kate, um, we, we always talk about what are the future segments or webinars we're gonna do. And, and one of the ones that we discussed that we wanna try to organize at some point in, in the next month is kind of debunking conspiracy theories that out there about COVID. Um, not necessarily that Eric and I would be actually, we wanna try to identify um, uh, one or two good pan panelists that come in and to talk to about all the things that you're probably seeing in social media that are like wrong. Um, and some things that like it's presidents not caused by 5G antennas. It's not <laughs> caused by 5G. We promise. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but but that's a very valid question of, of what are things you can do to immune system. So before there was a pandemic, Eric and I actually did a lot of research in IBD on a number of different areas, including environmental health. So we we're trying to study what are the environmental factors that made you at risk for developing IBD, and then if you had IBD made you at risk for having worse outcomes, needing more surgery or being sick with your IBD. Um, and not just Eric and I, but there's been research all over the world to look at what are the things that you can do um, to essentially minimize your risk of uh, Crohn's disease. And really what we're getting at is how do we strengthen the immune system to prevent bad outcomes from the immune system? Um, and there's now clear evidence from a number of different studies um, that a healthy life is associated with a healthy immune system. So the key things that you learned in elementary school, um, good diet, proper exercise, low stress, getting sleep, keeping a good healthy weight. These are all things that not only prevent heart disease, cancers, but also we've been able to show that also prevent the risk of developing IBD and also um, having worse outcomes. And those are the things that not only are they seen in, in kind of epidemiological studies, but there are really good basic science studies to explore how these healthy life things affect your health. And a lot of it has to do with your gut microbiome, all those trillions of organisms that your body's immune system is constantly processing. And you know, if you have a bad healthy lifestyle, that that microbiome changes and then predisposes you to um, an immune system that's not strengthened. Um, and just to give you one last example, Eric and I um, collaborated with an environmental health scientist from Health Canada um, who was worked on a study, and, and Eric, you're like, you're the, the lead on this, um, to look at what's called green space or parks. Um, and this is a, a study that's being presented, and it's currently the paper is being reviewed for publication. But essentially what it showed was that kids that played in parks, but were lived closer to, to parks, closer to green space, um, they actually had less likely to develop Crohn's disease than those kids who were in very kind of dense environments and didn't have access to green space and so on like that. Um, and so the, the message there is that, you know, these are things that you can do to make yourself healthy, not just, you know, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic. Home isolation doesn't mean staying in your home, in your basement. You can go outside, you can go for walks, you can go hikes. The Alberta is gonna open up the parks um, soon. Like, we want you to be outside, being exposed to the sun, being healthy, these are things that you can do to strengthen your immune system. Absolutely, and there's actually an interesting story out there now, a study that looked at vitamin D 
and found that people who had uh, who were deficient in vitamin D, uh, as about 60% of Canadians are, tended to do worse if they got COVID-19. Now, again, this may be a story of you know correlation and not causation, just like the Nicolas Cage story. But we've seen that with IBD as well, that people with lower vitamin D levels are more likely to be diagnosed and more likely to flare up. Uh, and so, you know, getting out there, not necessarily getting out there in the hot summer sun, you know, you still use your sunblock, especially if you're on an immune suppressing medicine, but making sure your vitamin D levels are adequate. And, you know, we should all be on a thousand international units of vitamin D every single day, just in case that makes your immune system slightly better at fighting this virus off. And so, and Eric, there's another question here for you, uh, well, for us, but um, I'll ask you, if you're on a biologic, so if you're immunocompromised um, and a vaccine becomes available for COVID-19, will there be an issue with receiving the vaccine? So there's a lot of questions there, right? So I, I'm actually helping to lead uh, with Dr. Jennifer Jones um, and the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology vaccination guidelines for patients with IBD, which hopefully should be published within the next few months. Um, and we've actually split those guidelines into two papers, one about live vaccines and one about inactivated vaccines. So live vaccines, live attenuated vaccines are vaccines that contain very small amounts of live virus particles, whereas the inactive vaccines do not contain any live virus particles. And so, you know, the question will be when the COVID-19 virus vaccine is out, Will it be a live vaccine or will it be an inactive uh, non-live vaccine? You know, I think that that we, we still don't know that yet, right? I mean, there's both, both types of vaccines are in trials now at various stages of trials. We don't know what type is gonna work. Uh, certainly the flu vaccine is not a live vaccine, the, the injected flu vaccine, but the nasal spray flu vaccine is a live vaccine. Um, so there may be both types available. And it may well be that if you're on one of the immune suppressing medicines, they are gonna recommend against doing a live vaccine. But if there's a not live vaccine, an inactive vaccine, then um, it should be safe. We just don't know. The next question will be, you know, they're not gonna make uh, vaccines available. It's not gonna be available for the whole world all at once, right? They're gonna have to ramp out production. So the question will be who gets the vaccine first and that's a discussion for health policymakers and politicians, public health and bioethicists, right? It's an ethical issue. Um, you know, how, where on the list will people with IBD be if they're immunosuppressed, like on uh, ustekinumab or Stelera? We don't know the answer to that question, but the hope is that whatever vaccine that they come out with, uh, you can take because it won't be a live vaccine. We just don't know that yet. And the one thing I, I would add too, if you remember those graphs I showed you about this kind of playing out for a few years, um, that's in the context of, of waiting for either a vaccine, which shorten that, of course. Um, but if not, then it's a, a matter of what we're trying to do is ob obtain what's called herd immunity. And, and you've probably heard that in, in the news quite often. And essentially what it means is there's enough people who are exposed to the virus who mount an antibody and that antibody protects them from being reinfected. So every one of those things, we don't know yet with the, with this um, virus. Um, we're assuming that if you get if you get infected, that you will mount antibodies. And there's a lot of data now to show that people are mounting. The next question that has to be answered is if you have those antibodies, does it prevent you from being reinfected? Um, we think that's gonna be the case. Um, and if those, if those answers are yes, then eventually what's gonna happen is there are gonna be people who are gonna have natural immunity because they've had the disease and there are people who don't have immunity and they'll be susceptible of getting infected and the whole idea of, of kind of diminishing this disease is that epidemiologically if 60 to 70 percent of the population um, has exposure has antibodies um, then they essentially create kind of a shield against the people who are susceptible it's much harder for somebody who gets infected to pass on that because they're they're coming in contact with people who are immune so they don't get them sick so they don't pass on that disease on and onwards and so um, this will be it regardless of what happens with the vaccine even let's say there's a live vaccine and we, and we turn around and say you know what it's we shouldn't be using it in people who are highly immunocompromised or for whatever reasons the fact that we'll have a vaccine and we'll start to immunize segments of the population including that other segments will have already have been exposed and recovered means we'll get to a point 
where we'll start to immunize a vast swath of the population and they start to form a shield against more vulnerable people who may not mount an immune response if they get a vaccine or who um, are it's not safe to give them a vaccine for example if it's a live one thanks so i think we're running out of time uh, i think we're going to start wrapping up i want to re remind everybody that a lot of your the answers to your questions are on the website. Uh, again, I'll sort of share a little bit of my screen here. Um, oops, there we go. So please do check the frequently asked questions in the COVID-19 and IBD section. Uh, there were some questions about uh, back to school and kids going back to school and work. And a reminder that that's under guidance uh, right at the bottom there, reopening of schools and the economy. And then finally, if you do have questions about back to school, back to work, the opening up of the economy, uh, I want to do a plug for last week's webinar, which I felt was fantastic. I uh, might be a little bit biased because it was really a, a pediatric focused webinar, but it was really an all-star webinar of, you know, the best pediatric gastroenterologists in the world, as well as one of the best infectious disease specialists in the world and Dr. Allen. So if you see here the, uh, the COVID-19 families and children with IBD, it also really goes into detail about uh, reopening of the economy and back to school, back to work. So I urge you to watch those as well. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. We we got some really nice compliments and we are seeing them in the chat box. They've been passed on. Thank you so much to all the kind words. Uh, uh, everybody's saying that these these webinars are really valuable to them and we're hoping that that you're both enjoying them, that they're they're passing the time for you and they're somewhat entertaining, but most importantly that they're informing you and that they're reassuring you that things are okay, that we're doing all right, we'll we'll survive this, we'll get we'll do fine, and uh, we're providing you with the most up to date information that we can. I wanted to remind you that we are trying to raise money for Crohn's and Colitis Canada as part of this. So if you go to getgutsy.ca, I'm sorry, gutsywalk.ca is what I'm trying to. There we go, uh, gutsywalk.ca. Uh, and you can donate there uh, to any team, really. And again, that this is really the, the top way that research for Crohn's and colitis is funded in Canada. But if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see uh, the Gil and, Gil and Eric's COVID IBD webinars team. And we're doing really well. We're, I think, number three of the top teams right now. And we're hoping that if you find any value to these webinars, if you're enjoying them, please, please donate whatever you can, a dollar, five dollars, whatever you can, five hundred dollars, anything you want to show that your support for these webinars uh, and to show your support for Crohn's and Colitis Canada, who are obviously struggling with the inability to, to do face to face, uh, you know, fundraising and the gutsy walk has become virtual instead of face to face. Uh, so we really, really appreciate if you would show your, your appreciation by donating to Crohn's and Colitis Canada, either directly on the Crohn's and Colitis.ca website or through the Gutsy Walk page. Uh, and with that, I think we, we need to send a special shout out to nurses this week, right, Gil? It's, it's uh, National Nurses Week. Uh, and I wanted to particularly shout out to the two nurses at the CHEO IBD Center, uh, Natalie Fournier and Chantelle Scholdice, the nurse case managers without whom we could not run the IBD clinic at CHEO. They really take care of everything. They're the first point of contact for all our patients. They bring any questions that patients have or any problems. Uh, they're able to order some blood work. They're able to uh, you know, do stool samples if they need to. And they really do the majority of the work in the IBD center, I would say. Uh, we're in the background looking on, but they're supporting us. So happy Nurses Week to Natalie and Chantel and to all the nurses at CHEO that I work with, please, uh, Danielle, Louise, uh, Donna, everybody there, uh, Shelly as well. And uh, Gil, I'm sure you want to give some shout outs to the people you work with. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, Kisha Saint, uh, she truly is a saint. She's uh, my nurse. She's also a nurse for Rima Panachona, who I work with as well. Um, and uh, she is being a foundation through this pandemic. You cannot imagine how many telephone calls um, our clinics are getting all across. And it's, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to do these webinars was because we're being inundated with questions and the same questions because what's on your mind is on everyone's mind. Um, and she has done a phenomenal job with the whole team at the University of Calgary Medical Center, uh, UCMC uh, GI clinic that I, I practice in our IBD clinic. Um, I also wanna make a special shout out to our nurse practitioners, um, 
Joan Hetherington and Mary Louise Martin. Um, they both have done a phenomenal job, including um, setting up um, a high-risk IBD um, clinic that is taking care of people who are being sick right now, um, and particularly not just catering to our clinics, but for the whole city. Um, and Joan, in particular, has done a tremendous amount of, of work advocating for the IBD community um, with working with Alberta Health to try to address many issues for Albertans um, with, who have IBD. So it is, you know, I, I'm obviously only touching the tip of the iceberg of the nurses that we need to thank, including the clinic nurses, our endoscopy nurses uh, that make caring for you possible. And one more, Usha Chahan from McMaster University. Uh, who serves on the IBD COVID-19 Task Force for Crohn's and Colitis Canada, as well on the SMAC, and who does tons for Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Thank you for all your support, Usha, in, in representing the nursing perspective and representing the patients as well. And one and thing I would just add about Usha is um, this past Tuesday's task force, we decided in honour of Nursing's Week to set up a special webinar for next Thursday on nursing in IBD. And so Usha is actually going to help us organize that and she's going to be a panelist um, on the webinar. And we're going to invite, um, we're going to collaborate with CAN uh, IBD, which is the nursing association that Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, supports. Um, and we're going to have a whole webinar where we're going to ask nurses across the country their experiences of caring for IBD during this pandemic. So I think it's going to be a really special webinar. Agreed. And with that, we're going to say goodbye and we will see you next week. Please stay well, please stay healthy and get out there hopefully and enjoy the sun, uh, especially in Ontario where it's been way too cold over the past two weeks. Take care, everybody. Thank you.